We're really, really focused on this idea that poetry has currency. And poetry should be imbued with currency. Poetry should have real value. And we should value poets and we should give them that sort of material um, you know, proof of that. Being able to give this art form the platform that it really deserves, being able to give it um, cultural um, primacy and you know pull it you know away from the, the back dusty shelf of a library um, and bring it like into the mainstream where we all are like bring poetry you know out of the pages of like the New Yorker where only a handful of people are ever going to read it and put it in a video game put it in the metaverse put it on your phone so you can carry it around um, really you know really are just trying to to hammer on the idea that currency isn't just about money although it certainly is it's also about energy and power and influence and resonance and culture. The stars of this show are, um, are, are Sasha Stiles and Anna Maria Caballero, uh, co-founders of The Verse Verse with, with Kaylin Iwamoto, and um, just pioneers at the forefront of, of poetry NFTs uh, and, and really pushing literary NFTs as a, as a category forward. So I'm so excited to get into this. Um, I'd love to give you each just a chance to briefly introduce yourselves as well, and uh, maybe just a little bit about, uh, you know, briefly what, what the Verse Verse is and what its mission is. Okay. Um, so, hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Hi, Matt. Um, it's nice to see you uh, during the day. <laughs> uh, my name is Anna Maria Caballero, and with Sasha Stiles and Callan Iwamoto, we co-founded literary gallery, theverseverse.com. Um, I am a Colombian-American poet and artist. My work explores the voice of the home, the layered exchanges of our everyday lives, and it takes the mundane as a point of departure to explore the transcendental. Uh, my most recent book, uh, which will be published next year, um, rips the veil off romanticized motherhood and questions our desire to package female sacrifice as a virtue. Um, I'll be reading a poem from, from this... <laughs> I'll be reading a po uh, poem from this manuscript toward the end of, of the panel. Um, I'll let Sasha introduce herself, and then maybe we talk about the verse first. Sure. Is that the manuscript that just got accepted for publication, by the way? <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Give it up. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, nice to be here. Matt, thank you so much for the invite. This is really exciting and a long time waiting for this chat, so I'm looking forward to it. Um, my name is Sasha Stiles. Um, as Anna said, I'm one of the co-founders of The Verse Verse. I also am a lifelong poet and creative writer. I have been writing poetry since I was, I don't know, like six. I got my first rejection from The New Yorker when I was 15. <laughs> like, I've been doing this for a long time, and I really, um, most of the poems that I write have something to do in one way or another with technology, with um, our relationship to technology, and how especially advancing and speculative technology are changing what it means to be human, are changing kind of the fundamental aspects of what we think of as the human condition. So I do, I focus kind of on two sort of experimental areas of poetics, one of which is really thinking about what poems look like going forward, how poems come off the page and live as multimedia pieces or as immersive pieces or as AR or VR or as haptic experiences and things like that. So what, you know, what do poems become in the metaverse? What is the future of literature? What's the future of poetry? And um, as a corollary to that, I'm also extremely interested in tools, new tools that are developing to help writers uh, change and kind of evolve the way that, that we communicate, the way we shape language. Um, so I'm extremely focused on uh, natural language processing, which is an area of AI that has to do with using intelligent systems to write language. And I've been writing since 2018 with a non-human co-author who I've been um, sort of mentoring and teaching and training um, on my poetic voice and style, and, um, and we do a lot of writing together uh, as well as with other collaborators. And um, so that's actually the, the basis of this book that I wrote that came out earlier in the year called Technology, which is um, a poetic exploration of what it means to be human in this nearly post-human era that we're in. And it's been a really, um, it's been an incredible experience and honor to be able to explore a lot of these um, these areas with the verse first we've really been dedicated in this first year that we've been around to pushing the boundaries of what language is to pushing the definition of poetry to thinking ahead to the future of 
of literature at large and, uh, and, and inviting lots of other writers and technologists and artists and visionaries to come and play with us in a little bit of an experimental zone. So, yeah. Amazing, amazing. Um, well, there's so much to talk about, and we're also going to have a, a poetry reading at the end as well. So um, let's, let's dive into it. What, how can uh, NFTs empower writers, specifically poets? Well, at the Verse First, um, which, which has really three main uh, branches, we like to, to call them. One is where we onboard traditional poets who have no knowledge of crypto, don't know what a crypto wallet is, are a little bit intimidated, and we walk them into the onboarding process. We pair them with crypto native artists who are going to visually interpret their poems. Um, since I am a Miami girl, I have onboarded many local and beloved poets onto the verse verse. My professors have been um, sort of our guinea pigs at, at the gallery. Campbell McGrath, a Pulitzer Prize finalist, for example, we paired him with Robness um, for our super space, a beloved crypto artist. Um, we also uh, elevate all text-based artists already working in the space. We've been lucky to work with artists such as Kevin Abosh, for example, um, who we consider poets. And then we have um, the branch in the gallery that experiments with generative poetry, with AI-powered verse, and with code-based verse. Um, for example, Sarah Ridgely's work, where she's using JavaScript to create a scenic poetry, which is poetry that you can't actually read. So as Sasha said, you know, we're really pushing the boundaries of what we consider to be poetry. Um, at the same time as we're onboarding, you know, Guggenheim Fellows, t complete traditional poets, but presenting their work in a way that's visually and usually audibly um, attractive. And what's, what's the idea here? Obviously, we want to sell these artworks, right? And in selling them, it's already almost this huge revolutionary power that we're giving to poets who haven't really been able to sell their work. Um, of course, we collect books, and we're all book lovers here. We're all bibliophiles. But a book sells for $14, if at all, a book of poetry. And it can represent years and years of work. So even a poet like Louise Glick, who won the Nobel Prize and you know, is an incredible poet, you know, probably the best poet working today, cannot hope to sustain herself as a poet. There's always a secondary career. Like my mentor, Denise Stormel says, we were all taught to think of the poem as the reward. And we all looked for jobs to sustain our writing habit. Um, so what we're doing here is we're saying poetry has value. Collect it, exhibit it, and curate it as such, such as you have done here, Matt, at the gateway. He gave us an entire room which we filled with poems. Um, so thank you for that. Be sure to check it out uh, after the panel, um, right, right back there to the left. It's really, really special to, to see it. And you know, we, as we said, we, we really do see the gateway uh, as a glimpse into the future and the curation needed to reflect that. And, and we believe in the future of, of poetry, uh, NFTs, of literary NFTs, and it's amazing to see both of you uh, leading the charge there. Um, did, did, you have, did you want to speak to that at all? Or? Sure. I mean, I think Anna put it really well. I think for me, I tend to, I tend to distill it into sort of three kind of big areas. And one is when we're talking about empowering poets, we're talking about empowering poets creatively, empowering them via currency, both like financial and also cultural currency. And then also in terms of community, like really helping writers find community. So, um, I, you know, all those things I think are really important to what we're doing at, at the Verse Verse and I know are very, you know, near and dear to what you're doing as well. But we're really looking at the ways that, uh, that the blockchain can really unlock new realms of inspiration, new realms of creative imagination, uh, and really allowing um, writers to do that you know, giving them a little bit of a helping hand coming on board. The literary establishment where we both come from is, you know, let's admit it, it's a little old fashioned. Uh, it's most of our friends from the literary world, I think, have been a little slow to adopt things like NFTs. So we've really tried to, you know, go above and beyond to show them here. Here are the reasons why you might want to come in. It, it's because it's really fun to get to try and play with new tools and see where that might lead your imagination as a writer. See what it might bring up to the surface that you haven't been able to touch in your practice so far. So that's one really big area is that kind of creative piece. And then, you know, as Anna 
was saying, I won't dwell on it, but just to kind of hit it again, we're really, really focused on this idea that poetry has currency. Poetry should be imbued with currency. Poetry should have real value, and we should value poets, and we should give them that sort of material, um, you know, proof of that. Um, and also, we want to, you know, take a step back and say, look, we all know, I think, at a fundamental level that that poetry is important. And we know that because whenever we have a really important occasion, if we, you know, at weddings or funerals or, you know, births or all these really intense moments, we reach for poetry. And that's because it, you know, it, it does something that we can't do through any other means. So being able to give this art form the platform that it really deserves, being able to give it um, cultural um, primacy and, you know, pull it, you know, away from the, the back dusty shelf of a library um, and bring it, like, into the mainstream where we all are. Like, bring poetry, you know, out of the pages of, like, The New Yorker where only a handful of people are ever going to read it and put it in a video game, put it in the metaverse, put it on your phone so you can carry it around. Um, really, you know, really are just trying to, to hammer on the idea that currency isn't just about money, although it certainly is. It's also about energy and power and influence and resonance and culture. And then just the last thing really quickly is, is really community. This, this idea that um, writers have to be solo operators who kind of shut themselves up in their room and don't interact with the outside world. I think that's, you know, also very outmoded. And we're really trying to look at the potential for the blockchain to create networked imagination, decentralized writing workshops, really help, you know, people who are around the world trying to find community, trying to find uh, mentorship and, and an opportunity to publish and have their voice be heard, really trying to make that happen through this uh, globalized technology. Absolutely. And like one of the most exciting things to see about, about the ways that NFTs have been disrupting the, the creator economy um, is seeing like digital artists finally able to build collector bases around their work, uh, finally having a seat at the table. You know, the idea of, of a digital artist selling at a major auction house um, was, you know, outlandish, you know, a few years ago. The idea of a poet selling at a major auction house, which, uh, which Sasha Styles is, is included in the Christie's sale here and actually just got a bid today, correct? Yep, congratulations. Um, that, that could have been unthinkable before this technology. And, and that's a really significant shift. And I've, I've always said that I feel like poetry is especially well-suited. Of, of the kind of pantheon of literary NFTs, it's poetry is especially well-suited um, to build a collector base of this technology because it can evoke an emotional response quite quickly uh, in the same way as, as a piece of visual art. And so I'd love to just dive into that a bit. Like what value judgments are we making about poetry when we collect it? What is, what is that significance of, of building a collector base around poetry? Well, I think we're valuing the poet's work. It's really as simple as that. We're honoring it. We're saying your work matters, and we believe that it, reserve, it deserves to be remunerated. Um, I also believe that, you know, this is probably the first generation of poetry collectors. So it's actually really exciting um, as a value proposition for the collector, for the investor, because you're collecting something that really wasn't logistically able to be collected in a way that represented its value before. I'm sure, you know, manuscripts of Shakespeare's, you know, writing emerged and that's been collected, but, but to collect the work of a living poet writing in the present time, fresh off the, you know, pen and paper of the poet in a way that really represents its value is something actually revolutionary. We have this incredible artist called Anne Spalter, who is, you know, and many consider her the godmother of digital art. She's a professor at RISD. Her husband is on the board of RISD. I mean, she's amazing. And she's one of the artists at the Verseverse. And she just keeps saying every time I see her, this is revolutionary. This is revolutionary. Poets hadn't been collected before. This is amazing. It feels, does anyone not else? understand how exciting this is and coming from her I think it just it gives it a kind of um of justification and and value because she's been around um you know she she if anyone's been early she's been early um and she is seeing that and is excited by it and I think you're seeing that too Matt and you're feeling that excitement um and we're just grateful for any stage that we can get to share it because we want to invite more and more people to collect poetry, because the more poetry that gets collected, the more poets that we can onboard. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it also has to do something with preservation in a way, right? Because like you just referenced, you know, kind of the origins of all this. And we, you know, we, we kind of look back at things like Sappho's fragments and like tablet, clay tablets from the very earliest moments of written language. We like really treasure those as important artifacts to humanity. And there's a lot of work being done right now um, in in new media, in digital poetry, um, in computational poetics and generative literature that exist only, you know, online or only as virtual items. And we need to figure out how to do a good job of preserving them, how to, you know, how to make sure that they have staying power and that they endure. And I think that's also the role of the collector and curators and all the folks who are in the ecosystem is to really create like, you know, uh, maybe sort of a new like, you know, Library of Alexandria or something where we have these really important pieces that we want to preserve. We want to be able to have the earliest traces of artificial intelligence writing poetry for the first time. Like We want those to be saved because that's going to be very, very important to how uh, humanity kind of um, proceed, like how we, how we continue to think of literature developing and evolving. So to have these as touchstones, I think, is essential. And I, I look at my work really runs the, the gamut from the ancient to the futuristic. And so my mind's there quite a lot. But I really, you know, look at a lot of the things that we're selling at the Verse Verse, a lot of the things that we're asking people to collect as those really iconic pieces of imagination that we're going to want to be able to look back on later. Because it says something about the moment that we're in right now, which is a really pivotal, really fundamentally profound moment in the history of human civilization. Completely agree with that. Completely agree. And, you know, it, it's interesting, too, because when we think about um, the, the way, the role that, that poetry has been experienced, you know, up until this part, this point in human history, you know, it feels quite limited. And that's why, you know, the, the name of this panel is Moving Beyond the Page. And something that I think that the, the verse verse has done an incredible job of, and both of you have done in your work, is rethinking how poetry can be experienced as a result of, of this technology. I always say that, like, you know, as a creative, like, one thing that's so exciting about NFTs is that it changes the creative canvas. And I think each of you have done this in your own ways. I know Anna from, like, your media-rich poems that include spoken word and, and, and overlaid text um, to Sasha um, with, with everything you've done with AI and, and the visual nature of, of, of displaying this and generative text. I'd love to hear a bit about, like, where, where are we going with that? And, and how can this technology really re reshape how we experience the, uh, the art of poetry? Well, I think that you touched upon something that's very important um, that we've been using at, at the Verse Verse and that I use very much in, in my own practice, which is voice. Um, you know, poetic voice is what we call the soul of the poem, like an artist's style. The voice of the poet is, is really important. Um, but we're also in, infusing these works with literal voice, with physical voice. And there's a physicality that's imbued into the poem when it's read by its creator. So we have um, these poets that are amazing poets um, on the verse verse um, reading the poems, pairing them with artists. So they become these immersive, experiential works of art where you're reading the poem, you're listening to the poem, and you're witnessing an artist's interpretation of it. So there's all these levels of intimacy um, that you can experience as a viewer. And what's really beautiful about digital poetry is that it's experienced in the same way the digital art. So now poetry can have a seat at the fine art table. Um, you know, before the way that we experienced poetry was very different from the way we experienced art. And so there was a difficulty, of course, in, in transacting it and exhibiting it and curating and collecting it. But now uh, that impediment no longer exists. So a curator, a collector, you know, uh, I had breakfast this morning with a, a curator from a Japanese museum who's interested in, in the work that I'm doing. Um, because now there isn't that barrier anymore. Before, you know, on, on the page, on, on, on a book, how would she have thought to exhibit it? But now there's projectors, now there's um, screens. Um, and it, what's beautiful that both Sasha and I have witnessed is that the digital is now returning also, it's coming full circle, and now there's interest in the reading, which is, of course, you know, how poetry started. So we're going to have a poetry reading here, thanks to digital poetry, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we do a lot of thinking, at least I do. I, I tend to think a lot about the, the history of language and literature, and I think a lot about the origins of poetry and the oral tradition. Actually, one of the projects that I just released this week is a project called Oral Binary, which is part of an ongoing series that I do that 
uh, kind of muses on the semiotics of binary code, but it, it has to do with the importance of, uh, as Anna said, the, you know, the quality of the human voice, the shape of sound, how that really plays a big role in creating a poem that evokes a very specific response. And I think about the oral tradition and how that evolved into the written tradition and how that in some ways was a way of making language more precise in certain, in certain aspects, but it also takes away certain performative qualities and certain kind of enriched embodied aspects of a poem. So, I, I mean, I'm very interested in, in this moment where we are now because I see sort of this evolution from oral to written and now to something else where all of this can come together in a way that is quite unprecedented. And not just for the sake of using technology, but for the sake of making poems more impactful, more resonant, more um, more capable of evoking um, emotion and empathy, which I think is probably the thing that we need most in the world right now is more empathy. And I think that's why, you know, poems are so important. But if we can figure out, as we have done as a species for all this time, how to keep evolving our ability to communicate with one another, and we get better and better at sharing ideas and sharing emotions and storytelling and saving and preserving the ideas that are the most important for us, I think that's that's kind of the key to our salvation because we're in a really precarious moment. So I think Maybe maybe one way, one small way we can do that is by figuring out how to make these pieces of information that we feel are so important to share, how to make them more shareable and more impactful and more appealing to people so that they actually want poetry and they want to carry it with them and walk through it and think about it. Absolutely. And Sasha, something you say that I absolutely love is you say sometimes that poetry is the original blockchain. Can you dive into that a little bit? I, I, I just love your explanation and thought process there. Um, sure. Um, well, I say that because when I started... Um, when I started working in a real in-depth way with um, with AI language and doing experiments with Android poetry students and things like that, I would do a lot of presentations and workshops where people would come up and say, it's really strange that you as a poet are engaged so much with AI and with technology because poetry on the one hand is is the quintessential human art form. And uh, poetry is all about emotion and feeling. And these are things that machines are not capable of. And, you know, AI is very mechanical and formulaic and algorithmic. And that's actually, you know, some people seem to think that's the antithesis of poetry, which I think a lot of my practice has evolved around this idea that I want to collapse that, that false distinction between poetry and technology in that way. And one of the ways that I... I, I do that, I think, in my own head is by realizing how closely linked poetry and code are, how closely poetry and technology are related. And I actually think, and I've suggested this, as you say, on a few occasions, that poetry is a technology. It's actually one of the, the oldest and most durable technologies that humans have ever invented. And, and poetry really, you know, came about as... Uh, you know, as a primitive data storage system before we had written language, before we had the printing press or books or uh, Instagram or anything, we had to use poetic devices like rhythm and rhyme and meter and assonance to encode ideas and make them memorable so we wouldn't forget them. So I always think that I'm like, you know, poems are programs, they're software. And, um, and just the way that now we have blockchain that kind of is evolving to create um, methods and, and you know, protocols for us to store information and make it um, durable. You know, poetry has been doing that for time immemorial. So I think that's another reason maybe why we've had this surprising response from people in the in the Web3 community to what we're doing with poetry. I feel like there's there's some really implicit resonance between technology and poetry, poetry that we're really, really um, starting to delve into. Absolutely. And, and as we look beyond even just poetry, like literary NFTs, the future there, how could this technology lead to the reformatting of, say, a book or, or, or other, other uh, more voluminous text things that we're, that we're used to? Like, where, where, where do you see the future going there? Well, I think um, the fantastic thing there is that we don't know. Um, it's only just getting built. Um, I'm actually launching a short story collection next week in New York with a digital press as an NFT. Um, and it's their second book only. Um, and there's very few NFT books out there. There's some. There's people like MS Borland who, who released a, a book. She's a friend. Um, but it's it's really to be to be written. And, you know, I invite... You, Keith, who's here in the audience, Keith Grossman, um, and all of us who are committed and bibliophiles, you know, from, from the beginning of our lives to really think about what we want them to be like, 
because it's all waiting to be written. Um, I think that, you know, of course, we've got Kindle, we've got audiobooks, that, all that already exists. But what, what the NFT component could really add to literature um, is something that Sasha was talking about earlier, which is community. Um, and I also think currency, because even if we charge, you know, the same um, value proposition for an NFT book as a physical book, um, I think that the fact that you're collecting it as this digital object that you want to preserve and keep um, says something about the way that you feel about it. There's, there's, it's, it's an interesting emotional uh, connection to the digital that, that I don't think will replace the physical. I think it can accompany it and enhance it. Um, but it's, it inverts what we're used to thinking in terms of physical versus digital. And I think that that is something that is going to be very important um, as NFTs and Web3 continues to grow, that inversion of our emotional connection to digital objects versus physical ones. Yeah, well, like like Anna, I'm also you know very much a bibliophile, and I also clearly you know I'm attached to physical books because I published one that's a very hefty object. But um, I'm also really interested in how this book exists as part of a larger um, sort of approach to storytelling as we move forward. And so for me, I think I consider. I consider it very important and very meaningful to have published the actual book. And I think there's something really special about this technology. And that's why books are still around and why they haven't become obsolete yet. And <laughs> I think, you know, it's really important to keep them alive. And one way that I think, you know, I'm personally very interested in, in, um, in investigating and ideating is how we can use NFTs, how we can use blockchain to support what books do. And maybe that has to do with creating ecosystems where the books are part and parcel of a larger um, narrative or part of a larger approach to how we communicate an idea or how we invite a community to come in. And, um, you know, maybe it's a, it's a way of writing fan fiction, a way of promoting a story, a way of, you know, adding layers to it, um, adding elements to the experience. So I think I agree, and I, I think it's very much the case. We don't necessarily have to only think about how uh, NFTs might replace some, you know, say the novel or a collection, because I don't think that's the case. I think they'll always coexist. It's about figuring out how can we unlock the possibilities that this technology offers us to expand um, readership, to make um, to make books, to make the act of reading um, important again and really valuable again. Um, and on that note, I just I wanted to say really quickly, I was I was thinking the other day. It's so interesting um, to me to think about the fact that, you know, as we always talk about, poetry hasn't really been in museums. And I think one of the reasons why is because in a museum, you know, you're standing around with a bunch of people all looking at the same thing at the same time. And for most of history, or for most of at least written history, reading has been a very private act. It's something that you did in secret. And, you you know, the idea of having your nose buried in a book is a very kind of time-tested, um, you know, cliche for a reason. And that's fine, and that's a, I obviously love having those experiences, but there's something also very important in this more connected culture that we're moving towards, in this, you know, this networked um, consciousness that we're all developing as a civilization. There's something to be said for having a piece of text that we can all engage with at the same time, and where we're all standing there and we're looking at something. And we do that now with advertising and with all sorts of copy that we see everywhere, but we're not doing it with things that are really, really meaningful and important um, and I think maybe that's something to also, you know, bring to this conversation is when we're thinking about where, you know, where NFT books can go, where they live, where they manifest and, and why publishers should care and why, you know, media um, folks should care and why readers should care. I think that's one big reason why. Absolutely. I think incredible points across the board. I could I could talk another hour, honestly, but uh, I know we have a couple minutes left and we want to do a little poetry reading. So um, why don't we kick things off with Sasha? Sure. I'm actually going to, um, I think I'm actually going to read a human poem, not an AI poem, just kind of throw a curveball. But this is a poem that I wrote in 2019. And it's uh, sort of about the future of poetry. So I just wanted to read it, kind of looking back and see how far we've come, maybe what's still to come. So this is called 10 Year Challenge, and it was written in 2019. 10 years ago, I finally handed in my ancient Nokia. I spilled Pinkberry on my Blackberry, met my husband for a drink before I knew practically anything about him. Obama was sworn in, got his Nobel Peace Prize, and we swore it would all be different now. 
I had mousy bangs. Scientists sequenced the whole mouse genome and discovered water on the moon. Moore's Law was still going strong. Cheap, mind-reading headsets hit the gaming market. I never used one, busy playing my own games, firing my neurons, hypothesizing what next, troubleshooting my mysterious, miswired technology. Africa's population hit one billion that year, having doubled over the previous quarter century. Troops and drones surged in South Asia. I got a flu shot, flew to China, let a heat-seeking scanner take my body temperature as I crossed the threshold to the Shanxi History Museum, where disposable surgical masks were trending. Climate gate opened. The great healthcare debate heated up. The auto industry stalled. Sully saved all the people on his plane. As ever, we were coming and going, leaving, arriving. That much hasn't changed. The present's always ending, so we live infinitely in the past and possible, inveterate time travelers with failing hindsight and prophetic vision. 2020 comes and goes with its own travails, another prime decade. In 10 more years, we'll know how to implant IQ, insert whole languages. I'll be a super poet then, microchipped to turbo-read neural odes, history of sonnets and obads, brain-laced, wisdom wended through the jugular, inspiration ad infinitum. We'll print solely on ether, Cloud, vellum, indelible, every word, a relic of sentient reverence pressed with angel ink, medium of our new nature. I'll go back to bangs, a halo, fringe low, over my eyes, to thwart AI reading my face. We'll book VR visits to the dearly departed. The first class will splash out on private reservoirs, and fresh spring water will sparkle, rare, diamond bright. The Dead Sea will die. Lake Chad will be a pale blue memory. California will quake. Voyager will keep rushing its gold record into the sunset, still the most urgent message anyone sent. Humans and robots will be best friends or mortal enemies. Some of us will be living in heaven or interstellar space, our new horizon, and I will miss you terribly. Listen, no one ever said the future would be easy. Thanks. Give it up Thank for you. Sasha Styles. It's an amazing piece. Uh, the piece I'm going to read is uh, a piece called Orchard of the Grey that uh, I minted uh, alongside a photograph of skulls from an ossuary in the Czech Republic uh, in February and, uh, min and, and auctioned for Ukraine relief shortly after the invasion. Um, so, I left the doll where it was dropped, the truncheon boots and flesh-toned fear drowned out our heathen heartbeats in the Orchard of the Grey. The papers fuel our daydreams with their perestroika screams. I left the doll where it was dropped, unmoved with skyward eyes. The streets were limp with silence as the wicked grins arrived, shrouded by complicit skies. I left the doll where it was dropped with eyes resigned to absence, adrift in far-flung moments while Red River flashbacks fade. Bleak daylight picks its victims and execution stayed. I left the doll where it was dropped, suspended where the memories stop. In dreams, the winds are sh chiffon, calmly covering the slain, propelled from contrite valleys, wreathed in hyacinths and rain. Thank you, thank you. The, the accompanying photograph is actually on display in the, in the NFT Now community gallery in Sector 11, if uh, you happen to go by there. Um, let's close it out with Anna. Um, thank you. So I, I'm going to read a poem that I, I um, wanted to share because I wrote it for a London art gallery. And um, this would have never happened without Web3. Um, I was asked to create a collection of three poems and we, sh we exhibited them in London um, at this gallery called Gazelli Art House. Um, and it was just this experience that felt very surreal to have had um, such an opportunity thanks to, to all that Web3 has to offer writers. Um, 
it's a it's a collection of three poems. This is this is one of them. It's called Once. Once I had a friend who was probably a boyfriend, except we were so little that swift age between toddler and child that it could mean nothing. I remember it as amphibian, small, slippery bodies, a game of spot the difference in the tub. His name was Juan once. Juan's large dogs knocked me over. Now I'm scared of dogs. I lie, say only big ones frighten me, but I don't know how to read the tight bark of any dog. Because I'm unable to physically harm, I'm also unable to defend. Juan jumped off a balcony around the time a horse threw me off its back as I circled Parque Simón Bolívar in honor of the beauty queen of Bogota. Because of large dogs, I'm afraid of all dogs. Because of one horse, I'm afraid of all horses. Other fears, such as maternal, remain fathomless. A word that means too vast to process and, at once, too complex in content to gauge. The last time I saw Juan was at an airport. As adults in transit, we don't speak. We reveal destination, exhaustion, frequency of self-imposed transportation. Safe travels, say hi to your family, to your sister. I haven't seen her in so long. The body in flight, the landing, the height. Ten stories, not as in tellings, but as in calculable levels pierced unfathomably at once. Us adults at the airport, the same as us in the tub. All past brims into a fluvial line to the present. One, once. Once, Juan and I were inseparable. Us together for so long. I cannot unbe at his funeral. I must remember it for so long. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, well, we are at time. Give it up for Sasha Styles and Anna Maria Caballero.